Welcome to the second in our series of The Majesty of Birds. I'm sitting here with Russ Kerr, professional photographer. And today we're going to go through a series of photographs Russ calls the birds of the wetlands. Welcome, Russ. It's so good to have you back. Thank you for having me back. <laughs> this is good. Russ, can you just tell us a little bit about where you lived? I, I know it was Back Bay in Newport, and is, is that where a lot of these photographs came from? Yeah, I lived in Southern California 27 years near Upper Newport Bay Ecological Reserve and Bolsa Chica Ecological Reserve in Huntington Beach. And there's so many birds there that come and go in migration. <laughs> yes. I just decided to do a separate presentation that I've done to Audubon and, and other groups. Nice. Well, I, I've, I've taken a little review here. These are magnificent photos that we're going to get to see today, Russ. And uh, I, let, let's just jump in and let's, let's take a look and see what we've got. Go ahead. Take it from slide one. This is a, a picture of the front page of my website, my current one. And it just displays um, the different galleries galleries that I have um, down on the left. And one of them is called Birds of the Wetlands. And the great blue heron is such a magnificent bird, I chose that for my um, home page. Wow. So we'll just jump to that bird. And uh, it's just a huge bird, about four feet tall and a six-foot wingspan with these beautiful colors. Wow. And the reason I love to photograph in flight is that you get to see <clears throat> all the wings and all the design of how the layers are perfectly overlapped and form this beautiful airfoil to, to lift them and support them when they fly. Yes. All right. Uh, six feet wings, six foot wingspan and four feet tall. Did you, did you see this bird in the back bay? Where did you find him? Um, almost every wetlands I've been to, <laughs> even in Big Bear Lake up there. Nice. All right, let's keep going. So you'll see these statues around the bay, um, the great blue herons that don't move. They're so patient, and they just are waiting for a fish or school to come by. And this is their weapon of choice, their beak. <clears throat> They'll either pierce the fish or grab it with its jaws. And so you can see it's actually stabbed this one on the underbelly when it grabbed it. And uh, so after it stabs it, it kind of flips it up, and it'll keep flipping it up until the head is pointed down its throat and then swallow it whole. That's his lunch. Yep, or a snack. <laughs> <laughs> so this is early morning, out sunbathing, taking in the rays. Looks a little immodest or flashing maybe, but he's got everything covered, so I think it's good. <laughs> And then during breeding season, they uh, perform for the female. This is one of its poses to show how great I am and trying to get a female to accept him. And when she does, then they start making a, a nest together. <clears throat> He'll bring a lot of sticks to the nest, and she'll be waiting for him, take the stick and say, okay, honey, you're done. Uh, go get me some more. And this is my job down here. So off he goes to, to bring more sticks. And then one of the smaller herons is the black crowned night heron. Um, they don't just hunt at night, as you can see in the sunshine here, <clears throat> but they'll be in the early morning or late evening also. But again, you can see why I love to photograph the wings out with all these perfect overlapping layers to, to make that airfoil. Russ, how do you get that focus so crystal clear. I know that doesn't happen on every photo you take, but wow, that is just such a great focus. Must be with a long lens, and then the uh, background is blurred. Yeah, he's moving. <clears throat> I use a 300 2.8 lens, so it's really fast, and the Canon body is nine frames a second, So, and it has predictive autofocus, so nine frames a second it actually refocuses and redoes the, the lighting between every one. And I have a, a big full trash can of those that aren't quite in sharp. So <laughs> this, is, this is the top pick right here. Yes, I don't, I don't share the others too much. <clears throat> so 
So like all herons, their favorite method is just to be still by the edge of the water, wait for the fish or school to come by, and then if they see one, they'll just slowly creep out there. And then when the fish get close enough, down they go and, and try to grab one. And you can see there's a couple of fish on the left already jumping out. And of course, <clears throat> there's the one that he caught. And he'll just flip it up and get the head first going down the throat. Another beautiful heron is the currently called the green heron. It used to be called the green-backed heron. But um, that's more descriptive because there's really no green there. It's kind of an iridescent sheen on the back if you hit the sun right. But otherwise, um, it just has beautiful coloring. This would be the male with the really rich colors. And then one of the largest herons is uh, called the great egret. And it has a, a large wingspan. It, you'll notice it has a golden beak and black feet. And I'm going to show you a smaller egret in a minute that has it reversed, uh, the snowy egret. But um, this kind of shows off the feet that you don't often see. Here it's coming in for a landing, and again you can see that about a five-foot wingspan and three-foot tall, smaller than the great blue heron. <clears throat> but again you see that perfect airfoil with all those overlapping feathers to lift it as it glides in. They don't always um, stand by the water's edge. They'll come up in the upland sometime looking for lizards and such. And so they just go along slow looking. Okay, so he just caught a lizard and the tail's kind of wrapped around and he'll eventually work it down um, to go head first down its throat. And as they walk along the upland, they kind of keep their head and neck really tall so it kind of looks like they're not looking at the ground. So maybe whatever their prey is will think that they're not being seen. And then when it gets really close, um, it'll start waving his neck back and forth, kind of like a reed, and his head will go lower and lower, and then we'll snatch it. But I'm going to show you a blow-up of his eyes and his head from this picture. And you'll see that the eyes are actually looking down, even though his head is tilted up and his neck is all the way up. Hmm, look at that. So he's watching everything on the ground, and maybe everything on the ground doesn't think he is, but he is. And then he can also catch a nice fish that'll do him for quite a while. They nest um, communally in colonies. This is a little bit below Morro Bay in California, and they'll just have all their nests in this grove, and uh, it just gets kind of noisy at night. Okay, then the smaller egret is the snowy egret, and it's the one that they say has the golden slippers. And ah, so, look at that. So it's reversed from the great egret with the black bill and the, the yellow feet. But again, he stands by the edge like all the others, and when a fish comes, that's what he grabs. But um, the snowy egret has quite a repertoire of, of how to fish. So this is the standard way. Another way they do is they, they go in the shallow water and wiggle their feet around with those yellow toes and trying to chase something out of the mud for them to grab. Another one is they'll lean way out there and try and blow bubbles to um, attract the fish and, and have them come near to investigate the bubbles. And my favorite one <clears throat> is that they will fly um, dragging their feet along They'll kind of fly towards the shallow end, and the feet are, are easy to see, and it'll chase the fish away from him towards the shallow end where it's easier to grab him. So here he is dragging him towards the shallow end, and then as he gets closer, the fish are getting shallower and shallower, and when one jumps up, um, he'll just jump at it and grab it with his beak. Like so. And then that will get flipped down and, and swallowed whole also. Hmm. This is snowy egret on a bad hair day, um, but it just shows that they do a lot of bathing and cleaning to, to keep all their feathers in prime condition. This is the snowy egret backlit, <clears throat> and it's just very obvious where um, 
an arm has turned into the structure that supports the wing. You can see the upper arm, the lower arm, and then the hand. Wow, that is just, it's translucent. It, it, that almost looks like his, the skeleton of, his, uh, of the bones in his wing. It is. <laughs> and the, if you get a great egret or a light-colored bird uh, backlit, um, you'll see the same thing. So here's the great egret with a yellow bill and the snowy egret with the uh, dark bills. And often people will say, oh, that looks so cute. The parents are out there with their kids. But when you um, are in a nest up in a tree, you've got to be full size when you leave. So these offspring are full size when they leave. And so these will always be the, the two different ones, not the parents and the kids. Hmm. Then there's some colorful birds in the marsh. Um, one is the common yellow throat. It has a really high-pitched witchety, witchety, witchety that uh, is very easy to tell where the bird is. But just beautiful coloring on it. And he'll get up high on a, a cattail to look for females and try and impress them with his song. Another bird is the marsh wren. And here he is trying to attract the female and do his calls. And this is a female that's a um, little bit drabber for the reasons I mentioned earlier, but she will make a nest in those reeds and it will be kind of hung like a hammock um, and attached to the reeds. Another one is the red-winged blackbird. It's just um, has these beautiful red shoulder patches with kind of a yellow tinge. And so mating season, he's out there showing off those patches and uh, trying to sing to the female. Jumps in some wild radish and tries to show them to her. And she's saying, hmm, maybe I've seen better. I'm not sure. <laughs> so he says, okay, I'm going to fly towards you and really show these things off to you. <laughs> so when they're not um, breeding, they wander in flocks. Um, and it's just fun to see so many in one place. Wow. This is at the San Joaquin Wildlife Sanctuary in Irvine. And I'd love to show off any pictures chasing crows. Um, they're not my favorite <laughs> bird because they, they take so many eggs. But here the female red-winged blackbird is in the lead chasing, and here comes the male with his wings tucked in trying to catch up. Looks like a dogfight. Yeah. and the Aerial dogfight. So they, they don't want that crow anywhere near their nest. <laughs> and there's several kinds of shorebirds. This is the American Avocet. Um, it's got that rufous color on its neck and head during the breeding season. Otherwise, it's kind of a pale gray. But um, it's a beautiful bird, too. And this is the male and female. The female actually has more of an upcurved bill, which is on the left, and the male would be less curved, which is on the right. So this is kind of the unusual circumstance of the female chasing the male, which hmm. sounds good to me. <laughs> and here's a bunch of them um, getting ready to go fishing. You can see some have the gray head and gray neck, and some have already turned it the full breeding plumage with the rufous color. And they'll go out in a group and just uh, try to stir up as much as they can um, to feed everybody. And what they do with that upturned bill is that they'll swish it back and forth sideways trying to feel for any invertebrates or anything else that they'd like to eat in the water. And so here's a picture of one that they actually caught doing that way pretty small, but um, that's how they catch them. And when they nest, um, these are their eggs. They just nest in the sand, kind of uh, in a bowl-shaped hole, and camouflage it with the natural stuff that's around there. And here's one of their nests with two chicks that have hatched. Wow. And you can see how camouflaged they are uh, if you're in the air trying to look down. Russ, you, how did you catch that one? I mean, you had to be there just at the right time. Well, I went with a biologist out on one of the islands and uh, wow. got to take some of these pictures. And you timed it just right. Yeah, well, he 
he wanted to do it during that time. So yes. I was fortunate. But I was a volunteer naturalist at this uh, reserve, and it made it easier to to, to so know he, those He people. knew what was happening, and he knew where to find them. Yes. And then the chicks are born what they call precocious. They just get up out of the nest and start feeding themselves, which wouldn't that be wonderful <laughs> with our kids? <laughs> but um, they take care of themselves. And this is just an illustration of um, not everybody makes it. Ah, uh, yes. Okay, another shorebird is the black neck stilt. And with those beautiful red legs, you don't always see how long those legs are because when they're walking through the marsh, you only see the upper half. Mm. But when they're on dry land, um, you can really see how long and skinny those legs are. Aptly, aptly named. <laughs> so they're so long that this is how far they extend behind when they fly. In flight. Yeah. And then when they're not breeding, they do go in groups like the red-winged blackbirds. And it's just fun to see those groups uh, with all those legs behind. And this was also at the San Joaquin Wildlife Sanctuary. And they feed themselves just walking around in, in the shallow water, uh, picking at things. And this is one of their chicks, and it's precocious, so it's probably only a day or two old, but wow. it's out feeding itself too. You, you don't even see any wings yet. It's so young. Hmm. So this is a black neck still with a lot of legs. Um, the red ones are the adult, and then the there's two kids that are one under each wing that are uh, oh. being warmed up and taking cover. And I've actually seen photographs of like four kids. Wow. <laughs> uh, two under each wing. And it's just kind of a fun sight to see. So this is mother hen. Yes. <laughs> now you still don't see the long legs when they're bent like that. Hmm. And of course, another crow chaser, which I, I love to show, <laughs> but they're very aggressive and they just want to keep the crow away from their nest and with no chance of picking off the kids. And if the crow sees <clears throat> one coming, he's, he's out of here. Yeah, I'm glad they do. <laughs> this is the shorebird called a killdeer. They just nest on the sand and put a lot of shells around. There's three eggs underneath there if you look close. And they're the ones that do the real loud, uh, repetitive calls at night um, that you can probably hear or in the daytime when they get scared from something. But these are their um, eggs laying in a nest. To me, it doesn't look that camouflage, but um, that's the way they do it. Not a lot of time nest building, but except for bringing all those shells. Mm. Okay, another shorebird is the marbled godwit. Um, has beautiful coloring has his bill that's slightly upturned. There's another similar bird with a downturned bill, but um, because this one is upturned, um, I was taught that because it's turning up to God, then uh, it helps you remember this is the God wit. And in a minute, I'll show you the downturned one. But they'll walk along the edge of the shore, um, just picking up any invertebrates or worms or whatever they can find to eat. But he's not using his full length of his bill there, but he can. And here you can see he's he, he's got mud up to his eyeball, um, going as deep as he can mm. to try to find something. And this is a very similar one. This is the long-billed curlew, uh, similar coloring, but with a long down, downturned bill. And this kind of gives you a perspective of just how long that bill is. Now he's not afraid to stick it in up to his eyeballs either that you can see, but um, by getting down that far, he's picked up this crab. Um, so he's very successful. This is kind of a hybrid bird um, between the long-billed curlew and the marble godwit, but it's really a long-billed curlew in front, and there's a marble godwit standing behind it, so it kind of 
gives you an illusion of uh, something went wrong. Oh, yeah. There are two sets of legs there, I see. One's out of focus. Right. But it, it's just an interesting photo. Again, they're really well camouflaged bird is the American bittern. There's one in this group of reeds and they have stripes on their chest and a long neck to kind of match the reeds and then they'll point their head up so that they still look like a reed and very difficult to find. Kind of in the upper left you can find them. Yeah, I see them there. It, it's like, where's Waldo? <laughs> but when they come out, this is how gorgeous they are. He's just been bathing and is drying and fluffing all of his feathers out. And they have these really dark black streaks um, on their throat to, to ID them. They have these very large toes to kind of keep them from sinking when they're going through the marsh uh, looking for food. This is the what used to be called the light-footed clapper rail. It's now been changed to Ridgeway's rail. But when I started volunteering there in the 90s, 70% um, of the world's population was at the Upper Newport Bay Ecological Reserve. Wow. So very highly endangered. And they take great efforts to try to um, keep people away from them during the breeding season. And they try to ban as many as they can, which you can see on the left leg there at the bottom. And they make a nest in the reeds, and they actually tie it to the reeds so that it floats up and down with the tide um, so it doesn't get submerged with the chicks and the eggs. Hmm. So man has destroyed about 90% of the wetlands in California. So <laughs> we're, wow. trying our, we're trying our best to help produce uh, sites for them to have their kids. So this is one version. It's a floating raft going up and down on those four stakes. And they bring a tumbleweed in to try to protect it from anybody up in the air. And this one was actually nesting on that raft. And then uh, attempt 2.0 was uh, kind of a <laughs> floating tiki hut <laughs> um, to, where they could safely... Uh, this is a refuge. Yes. Yes. <laughs> And so here's a, a, a parent um, carrying one of the chicks across the river there. And the chicks are born black, and you can see how small they are and um, just protecting them so they don't drown in the water. That is a chick in the beak of that bird on the right. Yes. And then another rail is the Virginia rail. It just... Um, very beautiful, smaller than the, the Ridgeway's rail. And I remember it as, um, it has kind of a black gray area around its eye to distinguish it from the others. And then a next smaller one down is the Sora rail, which is easy to identify with that bright yellow beak. Then we have the, what's known as the mud hen. And, um, this is the American coot, and it, it just loves to be in the mud, <laughs> uh, looking for food and wallowing around. But they have, um, they mostly eat vegetation, and they'll dive down and, and grab the plant life that's down on the bottom. But they have these magnificent toes, and you can see them splayed out here that help it stay on top when they're walking in the marsh. But they also can fold, um, here's a better close-up picture of it. But they also come turn into paddles when they're swimming because they'll, they'll oh. spread out like that. But then when they're flying, they fold back and <clears throat> to reduce the wind drag and make it easier to fly. And there's hazards of walking around in the marsh, and one of them is having a muscle clamped down on your leg, which this one has. And nothing you can do except patiently wait for the muscle to, to open up. And I... Did not stay around to see how long that would take. Wow. But um, very painful, I assume. And they have kind of a method of keeping people away. This is probably a male <laughs> with a female nearby, uh, near breeding season. And this other male comes by and 
So he kind of flashes this stay away or stop sign at it um, to let him know to stay away. This is one of the coot's chicks. And I think if they had a contest for the ugliest chick in the world, uh, he would be in the running, <laughs> sorry to say. And similar to the coot is the um, common moorhen, uh, a little more colorful with his beak. And it has those big feet, but they don't have those folding flaps like the, the, the coot does. But they've also kind of mastered the stop sign uh, to keep people away also. <laughs> okay, next is the brown pelican. Mm. This was endangered for quite a long time, and it's now off the endangered list, thank goodness. But um, they have a wingspan of about six feet. This is the adult with a dark chest, yellow head, and a beautiful um, blue eye. Well, this one looks brown, but it, it does turn. So they just um, glide along close to the water looking for fish. And when they get close, um, they'll start to head down and tuck their wings back. And they'll just do a dive straight into the water wow. to, to try to catch it in their pouch. Looks like they can go pretty deep. They can. Um, I'm not sure you'll even see the tail feathers when it's done. Okay, this pelican has a little different way of fishing. I think maybe he's very prayerful and thinks that maybe God's going to drop a fish in his <laughs> pouch if he <laughs> leaves it open like that. Very trusting. But here you can see the blue eye better. But he's actually stretching his pouch um, to keep it flexible. Mm. And here he stretches it all the way over his head, across his neck, um, to help make it flexible. So here's a group of the brown pelicans. The white chest is the first-year juvenile. The dark chest is the three-year-old adult or later. And then in between is the second-year juvenile. So it's kind of easy to tell them apart when they're flying overhead. Then a bigger pelican is the American white pelican. It has about a nine-foot wingspan, wow. and it's the second largest average wingspan of any North American bird. Um, the California condor is about nine and a half wingspan as opposed to this nine foot, but just a monster bird and wow. uh, great wings. I kind of took this slide for fun because I accidentally opened my camera and the light came in, but it kind of looks like oh, he, darn. he's got an afterburner. So I there talk you go. I talk about how fast they can go <laughs> when they turn on their afterburner. And here's the breeding plumage. They get this uh, thing on the top of their beak, and then you can see that beautiful blue, light blue eye. So just a beautiful bird to watch. And they like to do group fishing. They'll kind of get together in a semicircle. They'll kind of head towards the shore, hoping to push a group of, uh, a school of fish together closer and bunch them up. And then when they get really close and they're kind of concentrated, they all go bottoms up and try, try to grab as many fish as they can in the pouch. <laughs> what a shot. Yeah. <laughs> okay, this is a little blurry, but... This was in a river, and I was far away, but I blew it up because the you can see the large fish in the pouch of this white pelican. Mm. I just can't believe how large a fish it caught, and I can't imagine how it got it down its throat, but I couldn't stay around to find wow. out. But it looks like another one's going to try to poke a hole in his pouch to, <laughs> to get to the fish. There's also a lot of terns that uh, migrate up from the south uh, to breed here in the summer. This is called the elegant tern, kind of a thin uh, light gold beak with the black cap. And they always catch their fish by diving head first into the water, completely going underneath. And then sometimes they pop up without a fish and sometimes they pop up with a fish. But it's, it's a hard way to, to get all your food by diving head first into the water like that. But the elegant terns have a neat courtship. Um, 
The male will hold a fish in his beak and follow a female around, calling and calling all the time, trying to impress her how greedy he is. <laughs> and so when she accepts, then they kind of do a bonding thing, kind of like the blue angels. They, <laughs> they fly, fly in formation. They do. <laughs> <laughs> so they'll fly around, and I guess that lets her, all the other males know that she's take, taken. And they... Um, Breed and colony is really dense, close together, maybe for protection, but it's just a really noisy time to, to be near them when they're breeding. And they're always calling for food, and here you can see one of the chicks um, below the mom. Hmm. It's a lot of work to get out of a shell, <laughs> so this one is so tired they just kind of collapse after they get out and take a nap. <laughs> this is a Looks very similar, but it's a Caspian tern. It has a thicker beak and a much dark redder one. And uh, they breed the same way in the colonies. And you can see one, one of the chicks standing and, and one resting. And this is one of theirs that just got out of the nest uh, <laughs> with a lot of exertion. Hmm. But here comes Dad, the Caspian tern, bringing a fish for the family. Okay, I'll just show one of the loons. Um, wow. The common loon is just gorgeous in breeding plumage. And they have that haunting yodel that um, all the movies like to play uh, if you're anywhere near a lake. Mm. And when they catch fish, they kind of turn into a dart um, and go extremely fast, keeping up with the fish and trying to catch them. Wow. This is the same uh, loon not in breeding plumage. Uh, very different looking. It will just float looking for fish, and then it will go and turn into that arrow and, and come up with a fish. Okay, there's always ducks around the wetlands, and so I'm just going to talk about four or five of my favorites because they're colorful. This is the mallard, but the yellow bill, green head, orange feet, and then if you catch the light right, you see that blue iridescence in the wing. And you never see this unless you can capture it in flight with the sun at the right angle. Mm. And this would be the female with her brood um, in the marshes, keeping them all together for safety. This is the blue wing teal that you don't see the blue when they're sitting, but has kind of a crescent moon at the front on the male. But it has that, beauty, that um, light blue, powder blue on the front of the wing and then the white and then there's an iridescent green if you catch it just right on the yes. uh, primary feathers or secondary feathers. This is a cinnamon teal. It's, you just keep getting more beautiful. But mm. um, again, the blue and the white and the iridescent green and the red eye. Mm. This is the green wing teal. Uh, if you catch the right angle of the sun, you'll see the green behind the eye. And then um, on the back of the primaries. And then the wood duck, which, as everyone has said, when God made all the ducks and came to the wood duck, his last one, he just dumped out all the colors. And, <laughs> and that's why it, it's so colorful. Then there's some predators um, in the marsh. This sometimes called a marsh hawk, but more correctly, a northern harrier. And you'll just see them, they're, they're going low and slow across the marsh because they can actually hear better than they see. So they'll have the wings um, at a shallow V looking for rodents and birds. And the rufous color you see on the body denotes a first-year bird, so this would be a, a juvenile. This is a female, just kind of brown and white, but you can see the facial disc, which reminds you of an owl. Mm -hmm. And that's why they have such expert hearing, because um, everything gets funneled into their ear behind there. So they actually hunt better by hearing than by seeing. And they're kind of built that um, they can do a 180 in a split second. They have kind of short wings and then this huge, massive tail for a rudder. And to show you that rudder in action. Um, wow. Wow. It makes it very easy for it to turn on a dime and uh, get to where it wants to go. 
and the northern hairy has the the white at the base of the tail on top is how you can be diagnostic for it but the male is kind of known as the white ghost and it has a gray head um, a mostly white body and then the uh, black on the primary tips and he's about to pounce down and and grab something in there and this one actually came away with some kind of bird a, a rail probably mm. and then my I always love ospreys this is also yes. also known as a fish eagle and they have about a five foot wingspan and uh, this is carrying it back to the nest but the way they hunt is that they'll hover over the water uh, looking for um, the fish down below the surface. And then when they see a, a fish, they'll tuck their wings and go into a dive and actually go head first. Looks like they're going to go head first, but just at the last minute, they thrust out their talons and arrange the toes apart and then go in with the talons to grab the fish first. But they're not that graceful. They actually will <laughs> go all the way underwater. The bald eagle looks very graceful as it catches a fish on the fly and keeps going, but, but not the osprey. So here's one that he caught and shows perfect form for keeping the fish in line and reducing the, the drag with the wind uh, going head first. This is upper Newport Bay where I built a nest in 1993 uh, to try to hopefully get some ospreys to stay and raise some chicks. So in 1993 it was put up and then the first eggs were laid in 2006. 13 years later. Yep. <laughs> so Wow. Patience, patience, patience. Mm. <laughs> but um, they decorate it with different stuff and since 2006 I only know of one year when they they did not successfully raise chicks, so they keep increasing the population. Hmm. A couple other birds of prey are one is the red tailed hawk. Um, this is the adult with the red tail, and really hard to see unless it's backlit. But a red tailed hawk, as long as it's a lighter version, will always have the, the leading edge of the wing be dark uh, at the front, like you see here, because here is a juvenile red tail hawk, no red tail, but it has those dark leading edge on the wings that you can be diagnostic and make sure it is a red tail hawk. So what do they eat? I would go below the nest after the nesting was done and, and see <laughs> what they dumped over the side. And ah. So in this habitat, they had rabbits, uh, ground squirrels, and... I think somebody's banded pigeon that um, got loose or didn't This come. is your collection of leftovers. Yes. <laughs> so this homing pigeon didn't make it back, I don't think. Wow. This is a different habitat, more out in the fields, and mostly rabbits and snakes. And that's a king snake over there on the right with yes. the stripes that you can see. So here's the cleanup man, the turkey vulture. Ah, uh, yes. Um, feasting all, on all the road kills. Probably as ugly-looking bird, <laughs> but you put it up in the air, and you get light under the wings. You see this beautiful wow. two-tone black and silver with a red head, and they actually can look quite beautiful. And they have a characteristic way of flying. They have such a large wing area compared to their weight that they're really tippy, that they're so light. Um, because of all that wing area, that um, they always hold the wings in a slight V, and then they're always rocking back and forth in the wind because they're so light. So if you see a bird far away um, in a slight V up in the air, and you see it rocking back and forth, you can impress your friends that, yeah, that's a turkey vulture, even though it's <laughs> two miles away. <laughs> okay, the last one I'm going to show is the black skimmer. I, I just love this bird. Mm. But it <laughs> they have such unique ways of fishing. They drop their uh, lower bill into the water, fly along until they feel a fish, and catch it. And they're very successful at it. And they like to be in groups together and making a lot of noise during breeding. 
But this is, take a look at that bill. Mm. That's the only bird that has a lower mandible longer than the top. Mm. Mm. And then you look behind the lower bill, and it's, this mass, it's a massive hinge that the head can almost turn 180 degrees backwards, which it does to try and um, make sure it, the uh, fish doesn't slip out of its beak. So here's another shot of that mandible. So here it is coming head on. You can see how knife edge that, that bill yes. is, how thin it is as it um, slices through the water. And you see some fish getting kind of jumpy up ahead of it. <laughs> and the closer it gets, the more they're jumping. And so it drops the lower mandible in the water. And then it will snap its head back to try to keep the fish in its beak. Wow. So here's another series showing it, catching it. But remember how long that lower mandible is. This is all the way down in the water. And then as it feels a fish, it'll start to snap its head backwards and grab it with the top. And here you can almost see that 180 degree flip of its head mm. uh, with that big hinge. And off he goes to feed his family on the nest. And they nest communally. Um, this is one of the islands of Upper Newport Bay. And uh, so they just kind of dig a, sh a shallow bowl and uh, put their eggs in it. And if you get anywhere near them, they kind of have a broken wing act. The killdeer does this also, but it'll start going away from the nest, acting like it's got a broken wing and easy prey so that the coyote or whatever else is on the island will follow him and not go near the nest. These are their eggs, um, just in the sand, kind of camouflaged with spots. But a chick is coming out of that left one, and it has um, what they call an egg tooth. So I'm going to crop that picture on the left and show you what that egg tooth looks like close up. It's just kind of a calcium deposit that they use to help break the shell by uh, constantly pushing their beak up against the, the shell. And then that wears off very fast after they're out. So here's a couple of their kids. <laughs> uh, just little stubs for wings that are going to be long and beautiful later, but very camouflagey. This one's a little older. I think they're supposed to bring smaller fish to feed them. So I think this guy <laughs> tried a bigger <laughs> one, and I think he's has to wait to digest the beginning of it before he can get the rest of it down. <laughs> so I don't know how long he lay there trying to, to digest it before he could finish it. But here's a, a juvenile, and you can see the lower mandible is hardly longer than the front, but it does catch up eventually. So you gotta train the next generation, and here's mom or dad out with one of the kids trying to show them how to do it. And it's not that easy. So when they try it, this you can see he barely is afraid to put the lower mandible in the water. It isn't gonna catch a fish. So then he tries, well, maybe I'll put it lower. Then <laughs> he <laughs> kind of goes like a submarine and went too far in. But eventually he'll get it. And then the black skimmer also can hunt at night. And I've been on Balboa Island at night when it's dark and quiet. And you hear this slicing sound. And I look over and here comes a black skimmer slicing through the water in the dark, uh, fishing, because all it needs to do is, is feel it. Beautiful. So we'll end with that and end with a sunset at Upper Newport Bay. And I thank you for watching. Yes. Thank you for watching. Presentation number two, The Birds of the Wetlands with naturalist and photographer Russ Kerr. My name is Ken Kemp, your host for today's program. If you'd like to own one of Russ's photographs or if you'd like to connect with Russ, come to the website www.majestyofbirds.com.